I welcome everybody today to our fourth annual uh, Emerging Trends in Dialysis Care Symposium. Uh, the theme that I picked this year was measuring quality of life in end-stage renal disease patients. Why is it essential in today's fiscal environment and to get a sense of the global burden of end-stage renal disease. In today's environment, we live being regulated heavily in uh, patient care as well as uh, the f with tremendous fiscal restraints. How do we take this journey as a group? I, I have invited several speakers here. And first of all, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Sa Moro Salifu, our chair, Department of Medicine, to first say a few words about uh, the symposium. Good morning. Let's do it the Brooklyn way. Let's energize. Good morning. Good morning. OK, now we're energized. OK, very good, very good. Uh, on behalf of the dean of the College of Medicine, I would like to formally welcome everyone uh, to this symposium. Uh, he sends his regards, but uh, he would have loved to be here to uh, speak, but uh, he couldn't make it because of other commitments. Um, I'd like to also thank Dr. Sagi and the uh, you know, program management for putting up a very nice program that I think is very unique. Uh, it's going to address uh, some of the things that uh, we've been trying to measure, but very difficult to measure. And the panel I saw was excellent, outstanding credentials. I'm sure we'll be able to learn a lot from them and also ask questions as the day goes by. Um, we have uh, a number of people who are you know, going to be attending this conference from our students, medical students, to house staff, to our fellowship program, uh, the academic faculty. It's not the micro, okay, I'm sorry. The academic faculty and also community nephrologists and nursing uh, that are also participating in the conference. So to summarize, I would like to thank all of you for coming. Uh, I hope that uh, the conference would yield the right outcomes that we are trying to mm -hmm. look for. And uh, good luck. Thank you. So I'm, I'm going to speak. I'm Dr. Sagi, by the way. I'm going to speak a little bit about uh, uh, why I picked this topic. I do want to thank uh, the sponsors, the supporters of this symposium. I actually have no conflicts of interest. Here's my acknowledgments, and I'm so grateful that I'm, I've been asked to do this. It's an honor. Uh, and uh, there have been a tremendous amount of volunteers who have supported me through this. I thank the attendees for coming here. Uh, they've take, some of the attendees have come from all the way from Japan, and a lot of national speakers are here. I'm, I'm truly honored. Uh, so people ask me, why did I pick this topic? I, I said to them, could we have the lights down a bit? So does quality of life matter to each one of us? Does providing quality of life matter to the society? What is the definition of quality of life? Can we assess quality of life? And can we help improve the quality of life? So quality of life is being discussed in presidential debates. As you can see here, President Obama and you can see, I put this picture up because you can see the intensity of his emotions in this. So healthcare is very personal, I think. And uh, this was in 2008. Uh, well, what's happening? This is the presidential election season, right? So I said, let me, let me find out what surveys have been done. So I looked at Kaiser that does a polling survey. And as you can see here, um, Health care is one of the many issues important to voters in this election. In fact, it's the third most important. First is economy and jobs. Second is terrorism. And the third being health care. I mean, it's almost close to like 78% uh, of the population demands good health care and cost-effective health care. And what do the voters mean when they say health care is important? As you can see highlighted, it's the cost that matters to them. 29% understand healthcare as being extremely expensive in this country. 
And then when they question them, which one of the following healthcare issues would you most like to hear the presidential candidates talk about? Number one within is reducing the cost. And actually number three is they want the providers to provide better quality of care. So I guess I, I have made my point here of why this topic is essential. Um, when asked why are costs of healthcare important to voters, uh, they said there are financial consequences of paying medical bills. 20% were contacted by a collection agency. 20% had difficulty paying bills. 17% used up the savings. So actually it led to bankruptcy in 3%. And when the consequences of, of not affording health care were followed as to what happens when people don't pay their bills, etc. Um, well, most of them put off health care they needed, and actually from 29% of the patients who could not uh, get the health care, it increased to 66%. Uh, people skipped recommended medical tests, didn't fill a prescription, and if you can see the numbers go from 23 to 62%. So it has consequences. And digging a, further, a bit deeper, which voters are hurt the most due to healthcare cost, actually, which is shown in uh, the blue yellow boxes, those who make less than $30,000 a year are hurt the most. So it affects the people who cannot afford healthcare. Oh, well. Next question, how does one assess value of healthcare for each dollar? Well, we are taught that we should use something called qualies. What is qualies? It's a new definition for some of us. It's a generic measure of disease burden. It includes both the quality and quantity of the life lived. It's used in economic evaluation and assesses the value for money of medical interventions. In healthcare, health-related quality of life definition is used, which is an assessment of how the individual well-being may be affected over time so it, it follows trends by disease, disability, or disorder. To give you an example here is the quality of, of uh, adjusted life years. And that definition is mainly when you do an intervention versus when you don't do an intervention, how many years or how much time is, is lost. S in some situations, you could have zero quality of, of, uh, uh, of uh, quality adjusted life years and some of them can be negative. So obviously we don't want to work in, in that area, which is down here. We want an intervention to have given us a better quality of life, and dialysis being one of them, of course. So I put up a picture here, and I want to thank my Japanese colleagues as I visited Japan to find out how are they dialyzing everybody and how can they afford it. It's been a challenge to me. And here we can see, can we assess this patient's health-related quality of life? He does have a fistula, though. So <laughs> increased quality of life compared. Now here, how do I, as an example, how am I going to assess the quality of life? Well, you have to assess what would, be, have, have, would have been his quality of life had he had a catheter. You know, so that's depending on the situation. And we as providers need to be geared up to understanding how to assess uh, qualies. Now, could this patient be having negative qualies or, a, you know, so that's a possibility, right? You don't want to do an intervention where it will produce no benefit at all. Um, and this depends on many issues which we will be talking about in this conference. Uh, so there is something else you can assess. It's called disability adjusted life years, which is a better measure of overall burden of disease burden, of, and, and, and the, the metric uses time here also. So shown here, you know, you have healthy life, then you have something that affects you, you have disease or disability, you may die, or you might live expected, and, and so you lose the number of years of life that you've le lived. So it's a combination of years l lived with disability plus years of life lost. It's a little bit more complex metric. And actually, it's, when I looked at it, it's not that difficult to calculate. So let's say someone lived uh, uh, till 50 but had expectancy of living to 84. He lost 34 years of life, and there were three deaths in that age group. So there were total for the population, you lost 102 years of life lived. 
then years of life live with disability is becomes a simpler calculation somewhat where if you have four cases of mild mental retardation due to lead at birth as an example four um, and this is a disability weight and this is where most of the discussion is how much weight do you give to every disease and how many years of life that would have been uh, lived with this disability you get 115 years of life with a disability so countries with the highest disability years believe it or not is Africa they have tremendous disease burden and their life is tremendously shortened so they've lost many years of life that they could have lived I'm going to sort of skip this but only, only to to tell you all that there's a tremendous amount of maths that goes on in accounting uh, for you know someone with an older age that you start dialysis perhaps you discount it a little bit less than if you start at an earlier age so the earlier age you start obviously you use many lose many years of life and you, that's given a higher weight and in this equation you can see it's e to the denominator's ear the younger you are the weight is higher um, so I looked up something else I wanted to check which conditions lead to the most disability and lo and behold, I was amazed. I thought it would be cancer or something else. No, it's really depression. So that's why the theme in this conference being psychosocial issues is very important. And we need to understand that. And when we look, I also further try to look up gross national income or GDP. It is directly linked to life expectancy. So the richer countries you would have expected to be living longest, but actually, uh, if you look at this, the curve is very steep here initially. So you get the maximum value of life lived, maybe for the first $1,500, $2,000, but then it plateaus, and you know, some countries have remained below, as as shown here. So life expectancy is directly linked to ability to buy health care, right? So. I'm going to, this is sort of repetitious, but what I did was I said, let me look at spending per capita on healthcare and life expectancy from 2004 WHO data. So Cuba has gross domestic product of gross national income, meaning that is what an individual can produce per year, and those individuals spend $236 for healthcare, and so you, and they live around 77 years so I come up with a factor that on an average, Cubans spend 7.9% to live 77 years. Costa Rica, look what I found for Singapore. So they were doing much more better, actually, um, when you do the math of amount of dollars that they spend on healthcare. USA spends 13.3%, but on an average, don't live to 80. So something we are doing, some other countries are doing, perhaps we can learn from them. And so, so what is the spending per capita life expectancy in the United States now on an average is about $8,000. And that's a question I had for the attendees before. And let's look at dialysis. What is the gross national income per capita for renal replacement therapies? It's not as steep as you saw the previous curves. It's a little more flat but still the correlation is about 58%. So the richer countries can afford a little bit more di people going on dialysis. And the poorer countries obviously cannot. Actually, there's a better correlation with transplant. I was surprised. The correlation is higher. The richer countries can do better transplants. So shown here are the countries that are unable to provide dialysis. And shown in red are the countries that really provide dialysis. And you do have Africa shown here, barely any. Um, I'm sure there is, but this is what, what World Health Organization showed me. Um, so when can a country start providing dialysis? Usually when, you know, three times the gross national income. But if the population remains the same, but if the population is increasing, now you can, and you're not producing that much, now you have trouble. That, that, that equation where three times the gross national income is going towards um, dialytic care is questionable. So for example, here the curves are merging, uh, right here. So 
I highly doubt what's going to happen, whether they can afford if the GNP doesn't go up. And about 1.9 million patients, ESRE patients, are worldwide. 1.4 million are hemodialysis. The rest are written here, 23% transplant. This is 2005 data. And as we know, in the United States, about close to 400 million people are going to be on, on, are on dialysis now. I'm trying to make a point here very quickly. And so part of the reason that the epidemic of renal disease is going on, we all know, is diabetes. And look how much Africa has, about 50%. And Dr. Friedman might or might not touch on this. He's the expert. Uh, the consequences are that our GDP or GNP has remained low. Social Security has been trying to regulate some of it. The costs of Medicare and Medicaid are going up to provide this care. For every one person that dies, two and a half are living. So the population is growing around two and a half times every year. I found that interesting because I couldn't find that uh, data. So ESRG adjusted prevalence has been growing. Age adjusted, the most people that are on dialysis are in the age group of 74 to 75. That's the highest. And lo and behold, race adjusted, it's the African American population that has outpaced um, all other population. And we know that African American population has an apolipoprotein mutations, and hence uh, this, that, that is probably part of the problem. If you combine APO, diabetes, and disability without being, and not having dialysis, I'm, I'm sort of scared that it's a doom story in Africa with all of this happening. So we are here to learn how we can prevent it. Um, so nation's healthcare dollars, actually, most of the dollars, where it went, uh, and actually, most of the healthcare dollars for the go into various hospital care, uh, physician, uh, and uh, and actually, uh, from if you look at this data, where the dollars came from, they come from private health insurance, and about a twenty percent come from Medicare. Total Medicare dollars spent on ESRD by type of service is outpatient dialysis an inpatient, and a little bit for physician supplier. And total expenditures by modality, dialysis is the highest. So I'm going, believe it or not, ESRD patients have tried to maintain Medicare costs, while as total Medicare costs are going up. So we must be doing something better than other specialties. Uh, there are wide gaps in quality. So in the last two decades, we spent 2.8 trillion. U.S. healthcare is 13.3% in 2004, has gone up to 17.2%. Average United States citizen spends, you know, $9,000. ESRD is 10 times more, $90,000. Uh, so ESRD care is expensive, hospitalization costs, mortality is quite high. So a, a accountable care organizations were created in an effort to control costs and quality of care. And basically what it was, cut, 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 Medicare 30%, hospital reimbursement 30%, everything else 30%. And so it reminded me of this, we can't compete on race, we can't compete on quality, that leaves us only to uh, do marketing, I guess. Um, so how does a consumer assess and address or compete on quality and compare costs? The star rating system was created for patients to choose, but created processes to channel patients and specialty patient hospitals do better than non-specialty hospitals. This is what I feel when I'm seeing this in a public health hospital, county hospital. I wish I had not learned probability because I don't think my odds are good. Um, results of star, star system, just as predicted, specialty hospitals did better in the dark blue. But the issue is, can we object? We, so here's a judge saying you can, but in a proper manner. Um, so how does a consumer assess dialysis quality? Same old star system to entice consumers. So now you have an elderly lady for nursing home or whatever. Uh, so I think it's a marketing. And this is my stress level before I go to bed. 
um, to check my star system rating systems. And then how does the consumer assess nursing homes? Similarly, right, they put the older women's picture and how does, even physicians are compared. And this is what I feel when my ratings are posted in CKD Suite Clinic A. Right, my blood pressure has already skyrocketed. Well, I think I'm going to summarize soon is that, you know, this is a star rating system of dialysis. It actually follows Pareto distribution not a normal distribution and this is stochastic process like a stock market and what Pareto said was 80% of the problems are due to 20% of the causes in healthcare 20% of the patients use 80% of our healthcare. I invite you to read this paper um, and I, I have the handout and the solution to address such stochastic processes was addressed by Andrew Kolmogrove. Uh, where he said it is possible to stabilize this wide fluctuations. I won't go into the math today. Institute of Medicine supports it. We are seeing a new era. And end-stage renal disease has a QIP program, which you will learn today. The issue being they give tremendous weight to quality of care that's provided, but what have they created for us? A massive conundrum. Look at the 80, 20% Pareto rule follow, following here too. 20% to entering measures. And I was looking at this, I said, wait a minute, this, is, this reminds me of something. Nurses work 12 hours a day, four hours for caring patients, eight hours washing hands. That's what they're counting. And so these were my ratings. Our ratings were around 58, we barely scraped through. And we did an analysis in our SUNY downstate system for three years, so, you know, the costs are so high, and we can barely make some profits that go into the hospital. So when I divide by the number of patients, it's about $62,000 it costs us per patient to do a treatment. And you have to have literally every chair filled. If you don't, you lose. And who's hurt most with the cuts, believe it or not, is this labor force. So you have this in your handout. It is the people who are providing the care. And uh, Florida and, and uh, Florida as well as another state had a pilot program and they said managed care and ESRD can't work. They have too many comorbidities. Uh, we can discuss this later on. So I'm going to sort of skip. So for our seniors, I tell them, unfortunately, the, there's a casino available can provide you prescription drugs, but there's no benefits. So quality of life is the perceived quality of individual's daily life. That is an assessment of their well-being or taken care of. I, I challenge everybody here to see this lady. Again, thank you, my Japanese colleagues. She had post-trip GN, and she had uh, severe hyperparathyroidism. All right? So my question is, does she perceive a high PTH? Shall we wait? She has a fracture to assess her quality of life. Or does assessing quality of life matter to her? This is a lady who del was delighted to see me, uh, but she has a fistula at least, so she's, she's very happy, and she's showing me a fistula. So quality includes all emotional, social, physical aspects of life, right? And you have the CDC post this behavior, how many days you're happy, smiling, good, doesn't correlate to dialysis at all. Uh, and I challenge everybody to read this paper written by Theodore Steinman. It's a very good paper, challenging what is the best dialysis option in an elderly. Um, we have to meet the three goals, individualized patient care, population, and reduced cost. So are we getting what we paid for? Am I satisfied? And I see, look at myself at this. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. Next, I would like to invite Dr. Uh, Professor Eli Friedman. It is my uh, uh, pleasure. Eli Friedman is Distinguished Teaching Professor of Medicine. He is the Deputy Chair, Department of Medicine at SUNY Downstate. Dr. Friedman is a native of Brooklyn, 
whose career-long contributions to the field of nephrology have advanced the quality of renal medicine within our city as well as throughout the nation. Dr. Friedman established the first hemodialysis facility in New York City here at Downstate in 1963, and his work in the field of kidney disease is internationally recognized. In 1976, Professor Friedman invented the suitcase kidney, a portable dialysis machine scaled to fit a metal, uh, a metal attache case that permits dialysis patients to be mobile performing their hemodialysis off-site in hotel rooms and on ships and thus improving their quality of life. Uh, I can continue. He's extensively published. The list is enormous without saying much. He's an iconic leader. He teaches us all. He holds patients' hands and he tells us, you have to do the same thing until you feel the pain. You don't feel it at all. So, Dr. Friedman. Thank you, Dr. Sagi and Dr. Salafu, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we will consider the emerging trends in dialysis patients who react to what uremia is, because that's why we're here. It's the retained products that the kidney did not put out that cause the patient to have a intoxication that progressively increases until death if not treated. The treatment is necessary as evidenced where I think we see the impact of uremia best in monozygotic twins, and here one twin did not go through puberty the other, and did not have growth and muscle advancement, the other did illustrating the extent of interference with life that occurs in renal failure. In World War II, while the Nazis were occupying Holland, Willem Johann Kolff was able to uh, follow his attraction to the concept that the waste products might be removed by a simple process of filtration, and he built the first artificial kidney using a Ford water pump and a single sewing machine motor to rotate the drum. And very few people know that what he did for the membrane was to use Nathan's hot dog casing made by the American Viscous Company. He achieved by this dialysis an impact that was not appreciated until the end of World War II when his work could be published but he was able to take the uremic patient with accumulated ureal crystals on the skin with inability to function and convert that patient to a functional human being, even transiently in chronic disease, but there was no concept that the chronic disease could be repeatedly treated with dialysis, changing the outlook of renal failure. Dr. Kolff had four of his artificial kidneys at the end of World War II, and he donated them. The one to Poland was lost forever. The United Kingdom and Canada worked, and the United States version went to Mount Sinai Hospital, and we'll see what happened there in a minute. But the recognition of Kolff's import changed the world when it was reported in Life magazine that his artificial kidney could pro long life, though chronic kidney disease was not addressed at first, and the artificial kidney at Mount Sinai Hospital was tested by a, a young intern named Isidore Snappa, who later became a guest member of our faculty. Sixty years later, he lectured at this microphone and told us what the story was like in both the occupation of the Nazis and then when he used this artificial kidney donated by Kolff. And what's fascinating is how Mount Sinai missed the boat. Again, very few people know that they wrote in the American Journal of Medicine that it is obvious that the artificial kidney should be reserved for those cases in which restoration of renal function can be anticipated rather than for cases of chronic progressive renal disease. Wow. If we followed the Mount Sinai advice, we wouldn't be here today. The 
events that led to the use of the kidney in chronic disease were a trip to Atlantic City for Colf to accept an American award where he met John Putnam Merrill, a young post-flight surgeon who was the one on the Enola Gay that dropped the bomb on Hiroshima and then went to the Peter Ben Brigham Hospital where he began the first training program in kidney disease. The treatment of kidney failure was extended to war victims by the Korean War when especially hyperkalemia was immediately reversible using an artificial kidney. And here's Paul Tashan using one of the Colf derivative machines that had been made at the Colf Brigham unit in the Peter Ben Brigham and now Brigham and Women's Hospital. They sold 40 of these machines for $5,500 and America now started the treatment of kidney disease, but only acutely because Mount Sinai said, uh-uh, it's of no value to try and treat chronic kidney disease. But then a key VAT graduate of uh, the Mayo Clinic went to the University of Washington in Seattle and used a little device that made it possible to dispense with the need for a vascular surgeon for each dialysis treatment. It was the arteriovenous shunt. And that was uh, recognized by the federal government who held a meeting at which they wanted to know what was thought of as the uh, treatment of the number of cases that we would need. And that was a boat that I missed because I estimated that the maximum number of patients would be 3,000 a year in the United States, missing it only by 97%, uh, 93%. Ethical stresses from decided who shall die without dialysis when we didn't have the evidence. And Scribner started a, it was called a life committee, others called it the death committee in the literature. And they concluded, look at this, that people with diabetes, the most common cause of kidney failure in the United States today, older than 45, our mean age is now 64, unmotivated, what does that mean, or unemployed should not be dialyzed. And Kings County Hospital, when I applied, was selected for the first American dialysis unit under the auspices of the State University of New York. Reginald Keith Waterhouse, our chairman of urology, donated one of his wards, A22, and that was where we were going to build the first dialysis unit. But what I found was we didn't have AC current, and all the motors and all the machines had AC current. We didn't have drainage, and so we had to rebuild the unit. We started using a, a keel dialyzer made in Sweden, and uh, here we built each dialyzer each time with cuprophane made by American Viscous Company. And this was how the change in the ambience of Mount Sinai Hos of Kings County Hospital looked when we began the first dialysis unit. This was the first woman involved with dialysis. She later became a member of our faculty and uh, was wonderful to deal with, Norma Jean Goodwin. And we have women in growing numbers in dialysis and in nephrology throughout the United States. We didn't know what to expect from dialysis and some of these concerns on the physician, the house staff, uh, the nursing staff, the administrative staff will be considered. While this was going on, the American Alaska Foundation awarded the prize to uh, Willem Kolf in, 1940, um, in 2002 and to Belding H. Scribner. The first of the concerns was, and I'm having a little trouble reading it here, but the first of the concerns was related to the quality of life as well portrayed by Dr. Sagi. It turned out that when patients were questioned who were on chronic dialysis as we began, that nearly 61% of Canadians, for example, regretted their decision to start dialysis. Over 90% reported that the nephrologist had not discussed prognosis. Could that be possible? The other difficulty we have shown here with one of uh, 
Dr. Morosalifu's patients is that the patients didn't always agree with the doctor that dialysis should be started. And this is an example of a man who had a creatinine clearance of five to seven milliliters per minute and didn't want to start dialysis. We predicted that he would die, but what happened was he lived for a, a substantial amount of time. Is he uh, still alive, Dr. Salafu? He's still alive. And we were wrong at 79, and now has he reached 80? 81. And he uh, has not uh, yet had dialysis, so that's an, a stress on the patient and on us. What this shows is comparative survival with dialysis today and a transplant and please note that in every group, age group, that was studied in the geriatric subgroups, that a transplant was distinctly better than dialysis, except for the upper group where we don't have transplants because of bias by the medical staff, thinking they're of no value. Other current geriatric patients under our care have fistulas and catheters um, and grafts unused for over six years, stressing all of us because they didn't want dialysis and we wanted them to have it. And we were probably wrong. Could it be true that we should treat fewer patients with dialysis, as increasingly available data indicate, this conference will examine that, are we dialyzing people who are better off not dialyzing? Elderly patients who choose not to have dialysis as part of a shared decision-making survive a median of 16 months past a time when dialysis might have otherwise been indicated. And we saw one of the patients in our premier dialysis unit here who just decided to live rather than have dialysis. Undocumented immigrants made the front page of the New York Times when Grady Memorial Hospital in Atlanta was unable to treat them and they um, th they were not advised of what was involved with dialysis and about a third had not been fairly, in their opinion, told what dialysis was or that renal transplants or home dialysis were better than what they were offered. The impact on survival of dialysis and transplant is shown here by all age groups and what you can see is that the benefit of dialysis is much less than the benefit of transplants in green. The total U.S. population in 2004, the uh, end-stage renal disease, dialysis, and the uh, transplant are portrayed so that you can generalize by saying dialysis is nowhere near as good as transplant. And the provocative issues are what are we going to do about transplants when we don't have enough kidneys to use? Should we use priority because of distinction? If the president needs a kidney, should he get or she get a kidney earlier or with priority over someone who is not president? Should the pope get a kidney? We could go on and wonder whether we should be able to buy kidneys. We'll look at that in a minute. Uh, but here we come back to what I said on the New York Times, and that is that the front page of the newspaper, one of the best papers in the world, had 15 illegal immigrants thrown out of the dialysis unit when the, um, Grady decided they couldn't afford to have it any longer. What an ethical stress. Not all of them died, uh, or immediately some went on for months, but then they all died and we had a scandal and a sadness. Another challenging issue is whether or not you can be too old to start dialysis. Is that so or is it not so? If we look here and look at the age of patients uh, who started before and after initiation of dialysis, within one year, the majority of patients who were older, who uh, were in the geriatric age group, were dead. Should we not have started them on dialysis or should we have allowed them like Dr. Salafu's patient to live without dialysis, which they would have done even though we didn't appreciate that they can do that. Look at this study that uh, was reported of 379 patients, 75 years or older, who have begun on dialysis at the Mayo Clinic. The six-month mortality was 40%, while the 76% starting dialysis after an acute medical or surgical event had a six-month mortality of 73%. Do we know this? Do we tell this to the families? Should we offer renal replacement therapy 
to all patients who have renal failure? It's a real tough question, and it'll come up again in the papers that you're going to hear. In the United Kingdom today, 52% of patients over the age of 75 who have um, kidney failure are not started on dialysis. 80% of units called for better evidence that uh, conservative care does not result in more deaths than dialysis. So there is no clear answer to the question of who should be dialyzed, even though some of the presentations today will tell you they have a, uh, a clear answer. Are any very old people really well on dialysis, or should we just stop? Well, now we have another problem, because if we look at our own experience, here is a woman who is 72. She was dying. She um, was preparing for a funeral, and she started dialysis here. Three months later, she enrolled in Weight Watchers because she gained weight, she was happy, she was running a family. Did we anticipate it? Did I anticipate it? No, but that's what happened. And what about in the 10th decade? Well, um, after what you've said, shouldn't we just dispense with treating anyone in the 10th decade? Here are two patients in the 10th decade from our own experience. The one on the, your left, uh, they're, they're both 94 years old. The one on our left had some, uh, this time I had run uh, Dr. Sagi before, it's, it's really off. No, it started me with a, a penalty of 12 minutes. Uh, both uh, aged 94 years old, and the uh, one on the right, and the one on the left took a, a son shopping just before she came for her appointment with me, and the one on the right had a 94-year-old father, had two sons are there, who didn't know where he was, didn't know what was happening, and didn't know why he was seeing me, maybe showing good judgment. Uh, but here is one of the community dialysis units where I asked them if they would kindly get everybody over 80 so I could see whether they were happy or sad because I needed to report this as part of my assessment. And what we see is they're being over 80 and they're happy about it on dialysis. And what about the diabetics who we were advised not to have? Well, the diabetics over 80 were happy also. Their hand, all the diabetics had uh, their hands up. The mean age of patients we're treating in the United States has risen progressively. The uh, other therapy that needs to be put into our minds when we're discussing kidney failure is kidney transplant. And we need to know whether somebody old can do well with a kidney transplant. Here are patients over 70 in our program who got a kidney transplant who were happy, who posed for a picture for me. And I was accused of saying, of getting the picture to be happy because they were given free shirts. Uh, and here are transplants who are happy who did not get free shirts. And so uh, the uh, transplant patients can be happy um, as can dialysis patients. And here's a, a wonderful example of a man who is 87 years old. He's now about 91, and he had a transplant, not a day in the hospital, and he's fully active and happy. So transplants are very good for old people. And we can look here at the prevalent old versus young patients, and um, the, uh, two, each age subset has two colors of, of red, the red is for diabetic patients, and what we are seeing is that we can achieve a very good um, survival in patients who are old, whether or not they have diabetes with a transplant and with dialysis. And this is surprising to me. It's an analysis of our patients. The red are the old patient group with 75 plus, and at one year through five years, their survival was about in the middle of the other age groups, so I could not generalize in saying that being old meant you wouldn't have good survival. The demand for kidneys, once I started saying we should do more transplants, was outstripped by the availability of kidneys, and this is the wait, wait list in New York. It is, uh, it is now over nine years. The half of kidney transplants who are older than 60 years are placed on the waiting list, and it's a long wait, and a good number die before they get their kidney. 
Other schemes that you should know about are this one, again, in the New York Times, where they try and find uh, don donors according to the, con the, the screening content of genes in the recipient. And in this chain, they had 124, 17 hospitals, 11 states, 30 donors, 30 recipients. Wow, not many people are involved with that kind of a, 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 a sequence. Two other therapies I'd like to tell you about. One, the bionic kidney, and there was a, the older people in the audience will probably remember the uh, Lee Majors in the Six Million Dollar Man series. He was really wonderful, a bionic man. And by 2013, we had doctors who had bionic arms, like this one, who were building bionic people, and they really worked. And indeed, David Humes, a professor of medicine in Michigan, has built a bionic kidney and is getting ready to do a human trial, which uh, will give us some information, and we may be able to do away with dialysis completely. Dr. Humes won the Kolf Award. This was Kolf's son who gave it to him in 2013, and these tests are going on, and we'll hear more at perhaps the next conference that Dr. Saki has. Also at the Massachusetts General Hospital, there is a, a rat kidney seeded with human endothelial cells that is working, and the human trials are, are set for about 215, and we'll hear about that. But the world can't afford uremia therapy when we get to these devices, as Dr. Sagi intimated. And here we can see the annual cost per patient that interferes with our ability to give dialysis. And the diabetics are slightly more, but dialysis is bad, transplants are bad in cost for all. And the amount of money that countries have is such that they can't afford the treatment. If you can look at China, the most populous country, they have $5,000 per person. India, it's bad compared with the USA. And even the USA per person is less than one year of dialysis. I'm not going to go into the country by country, but we can see that at the very bottom of the country list, there are um, the African countries, and at the top, the few that can afford it uh, and are continuing to treat uremia properly. If we compare something that more of us know about in the United States than what's happening in Uganda or Sierra Leone, in Jamaica, with about two and a half million, and in Brooklyn, with about two and a half million, there are two different levels of dialysis unit, and look at the difference in per patient uh, earning. Uh, in uh, the United States, in New York, Brooklyn, it was 43,000. In Jamaica, 4,600. They just can't afford what we would want to give them to keep their life uh, going. So the feudal prognosis, regional and national budgets, uh, allocation must be ethical and is often stressful. Um, and there are now appeals to treat fewer patients and to be more sensible and just give it to those who will be able to go back to work and serve us community. Um, we should know that you can get on a plane today and go to Mexico and buy a kidney and all surgery for $47,000. I verified that uh, last month and I know, I think, three people who bought their kidneys in Mexico and they work. So should someone in your kidney need a kidney, if someone in your family need a kidney, what would you do? Would you buy it? You don't have to answer. Uh, the good news, a bit of good news in my uh, lamenting here, the end-stage renal disease rate and mortality are decreasing. The uh, uh, last of the therapies I'll mention to you is the uh, cholera-like induced diarrhea has in nitrogenous waste, thereby benefiting uh, uh, uremic patients, and this was shown by a study in uh, China with diarrhea therapy, and it really worked that for a period of time, uh, patients could be given diarrhea sessions for three times a week, and they still can, uh, even if they have clearances down to four or five milliliters per minute, and that's another way of keeping a uremic patient alive. And the uh, final study, is that you'll be hearing about, I'm almost certain, and Dr. Ranganathan, who's on the program, will tell you about it, is to use bacteria fed to patients to treat their 
uremia because the bacteria changed the waste products that I mentioned at the beginning uh, to uh, usable products and the patient is no longer intoxicated. Thomas Chang at McGill University genetically engineered cells and what he showed was that if he gave them to uremic rats or rats who were subjected to um, bilateral nephrectomy that their level of urea came down as long as he gave the bionic um, waste, pro the bionic bacteria and uh, he was able to treat kidney failure that way. And uh, the uh, probiotic organisms were named, the term probiotics, Mechnikov named it, uh, they are thought to be target specific and we have, Dr. Salafu uh, participated in a study uh, that was used of the um, Ranganathan um, mixture and what we found here compared to the other countries is that 8 out of 10 patients had a lowering of their serum creatinine, there was no adverse effect and that the probiotic trial indicates this is a path worth following. So that safety, no adverse effects, the BUN levels decreased, the creatinine levels uh, decreased and by 2016, dose escalation studies will be running again at the Mayo Clinic, Thomas Jefferson, and Downstate. Find out in what way your patient is unique, and by 2022, ideal uremia therapy will include probiotics and xenografts alongside a bionic kidney, and dialysis may be out of business, and um, I think we have to explain to our patients what we're doing and why we're doing it, preparing their patient for the therapy, and it's pretty uh, striking that prior to starting renal replacement therapy, one-third of the patients felt that they had not been told that, uh, the th what the therapies were and how a kidney transplant and home dialysis outrank standard home, uh, dialysis. So what is it that I would like you to have? Uh, to, uh, to remember that dialysis survival is improving. Unquestionably, a kidney transplant is better. Patients must be a partner in the decision-making. Probiotics may be coming. A bionic kidney may be at this podium the next time. A xenografts are possible. And enough is enough, and I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Friedman. So I'm sorry I put an extra layer of stress with time. Um, the next speaker is uh, Professor Alan Krieger. Uh, I'm delighted to have him here. He, he is Clinical Professor of Medicine, Yale University School of Medicine, Vice President, Chief Quality Officer, Yale New Haven Health System. He served formerly as Senior Vice President, Chief Medical of Officer, Hospital of St. Raphael, New Haven, Connecticut. Um, he is a past president of the Renal Physician Association and serves on its Quality, Safety, and Accountability Committee. He's a past president of the Forum of ESRD Networks. He's chairman of the Steering Committee for the NIH Frequent Hemodialysis Study, a national prospective randomized study of in-center uh, daily and home nocturnal hemodialysis. Dr. Klieger has received several teaching awards from the Yale House staff and in February 2000 was a recipient of James Col Colangelo Award of the Connecticut National Kidney Foundation for Distinguished Service to the Renal Community. In September 2004, he received the Maureen London AAKP Renal Rife Life Award from the American Association of Kidney Patients. So Dr. Klieger, welcome. Good morning, everybody. So we just heard um, from Dr. Friedman sort of the whirlwind world tour from the 100,000 foot level of what our challenges are in nephrology. I'd like to speak on a much more um, uh, mundane level. I really want to talk about what we're doing today, how what we're doing is being measured, and whether or not we currently are using the right ways of measuring quality. So back um, several years ago, Michael Porter published in the New England Journal 
a way to define value in healthcare. And he suggested that the equation was that value is the health outcomes that we achieve divided by the dollars that we spend. And it's important to know that even though we clinicians like to focus on the numerator, that we have to spend some time thinking about this denominator as well. And as he described it, the dollars spent include the full cycle of care. So for example, are your patients getting their vascular access done as outpatients, where it's much less expensive? Or are most of your patients starting dialysis, not from a hospital bed, but are most of them starting dialysis as outpatients being brought to outpatient dialysis facilities? But looking at the full cycle of cost is really important. You'll hear several times today, as you have already, that ESRD care is very costly. You see here that if we examine just the Medicare payments, um, USRDS reported that we were at about $30 billion a year back in 2013, and the current estimates in 2016 are close to $40 billion a year. This is exceedingly costly business that we do. And if you break down where the spending is, this is really sort of interesting. Take a look at this. You'll see that on the national average, this is a recent estimate, I guess you do better here in Brooklyn, uh, but on the national average it costs about $87,000 per year per patient to provide dialysis. That inpatient costs represent a third of that cost. The dialysis represents another approximately a third. And all the rest of care represents the other third. And so if you were paying for patients care who had end-stage kidney disease, where would be the likely source you would look to try to find better efficiencies of care? It's in the big targets there, and the big target clearly is to reduce inpatient care and also to be as efficient as we can in providing end-stage kidney disease care. And you'll see that we have some current experiments in figuring out how that can be done if the cost of care is aligned, if the incentives are aligned, so that physicians and patients together making the best decisions for themselves are given the uh, kinds of incentives to have efficiencies of care. This is a, a, a recent, this last year's FMC's um, de demonstration project looking at what they could do to reduce the cost of care. And as you'll see here, the cost of uh, care for hospitalizations was shown to be reduced by 20%, a very substantial fraction. The adjusted one-year mortality at the same time was improved by 36%. So the opportunities to improve value, both by increasing the numerator and decreasing that denominator are here and are clearly present and available for all of us. And part of it, looking at uh, this experiment we just looked at, is seeing whether or not we nephrologists are going to be prepared to enter advanced payment models such as accountable care organizations or end-stage renal disease uh, uh, seamless care organizations, a type of accountable care organizations that we're being asked to participate in? Well, the answer, I think, is already in, because but while we had lots of speculation in the past about whether we nephrologists or other physicians would participate in accountable care or other new ways of payment, now we have clear legislation. This legislation of the Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act of 2015 did several things that were really critical that will determine our future. Because they say that we will be really paid in one of two ways, either with this merit-based incentive payment system, which is a variety of fee-for-service, 
or we'd be willing to enter into one of these advanced payment models. And if you look carefully at the comparison between the two, you'll see that there are substantial financial incentives for all physicians, including nephrologists, to start moving over into the advanced payment models. Payment models that incentivizes not only the potential of profit if you do well, but also its upside and downside risk, the willingness and ability to be penalized if we don't do efficient care. If you look very critically at this, you'll see that those of us who choose to stay in more traditional fee-for-service models will have substantial, substantially less yearly updates to our payments. And you'll see that we will not have the opportunity to earn the kind of financial bonuses that in the future may well be the difference between being able to make it and not being able to make it. So we now have written into law a pathway that um, I suspect will move most of us into advanced payment models in the future. So that was the denominator. That was looking at the costs. This conference is really all about the numerator. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about those healthcare outcomes that we achieve and what are those measures that are currently used to measure how well our patients are doing and whether the government in Medicare is getting its money's worth in getting, that, uh, getting those measures done well. So again, what Michael Porter said is that if we look at that healthcare outcomes achieved, they must be defined around the patient. Values for patients determine the rewards for all others. So outcomes that are measures, he said, have to be patient outcomes, not the outcome for the clinic or the outcome for the doctor. Also, he talked about it being actual outcomes achieved and not the volume of service delivered. Do you know how to put the volume up? Improving the quality of health care is a top priority for the Department of Health and Human Services for us here at CMS. And we know how important it is to you as a health care provider. That's why CMS continues to promote and support quality initiatives. CMS has quality initiatives that touch every aspect of the health care system. For example, consumers can now find public reporting on the quality of nursing homes, hospitals, home health agencies, and kidney dialysis facilities. The key to our approach is using quality measures. Quality measures give everyone a way to evaluate health care by using recognized standards as a common yardstick. In this way, quality measures are tools that CMS can use to evaluate everything from healthcare processes to outcomes, patient perceptions, and organizational systems. In the end, quality measures are about making sure that all patients get the right care at the right time. Quality measurement is an integral part of many CMS initiatives, including the Physician Quality Reporting System, the Hospital Inpatient Quality Reporting Program, the Electronic Health Record, or EHR, incentive programs, and accountable care organizations. And today, quality measures are undergoing a revolution. Up until now, most quality measures were based on chart abstraction and captured on paper. Claims and clinical data had to be pulled out of paper medical records. This made evaluating performance or comparing patient outcomes a labor-intensive process that was both inefficient and costly. Now that medical records are going electronic, quality measures can follow. Electronic quality measures called E-measures or ECQMs, which is short for electronic clinical quality measures, are standardized performance measures in an electronic format. As health IT continues to play a bigger role in how healthcare is delivered, eCQMs will be an integral part of CMS quality initiatives to improve healthcare. These new eCQMs can help to provide real meaningful data. And not only is that good for an individual provider to use, 
but it also helps us make big policy decisions and set new best practices for improving the health of patients in our system. CMS is committed to assuring quality health care for our Medicare beneficiaries and for all Americans. We believe that accountability and public disclosure are powerful tools for making those choices. To find out more, go to the eHealth website and look for quality measurement under the Programs tab. Thanks. So, in CMS's view, this should be a pretty straightforward task. We abstract data from the electronic medical record. We use appropriate measures um, in several different arenas to measure how our patients are doing. And we can deliver a clear report card and quality to our patients. So let's have a look to see historically how we've done in nephrology with those kinds of measures. The historical measures, as you well know, that we currently have that are publicly reported and indeed are used uh, by uh, the payer, Medicare, to pay dialysis facilities, include measures of dialysis adequacy, anemia, vascular access, and more recently, mortality. And we actually do have one patient-centered metrics, uh, the ICAPS, uh, or patient satisfaction measures that have been reported. But if you look very critically at those measures and look at mortality, which of those measures measure anything having to do with what most of our patients die with? If you look at this graph, you see that most of our patients, the upper half, all those categories, die of heart disease. The second largest grouping in the left-hand side is infection. So the measures that we've been using traditionally to measure how well our dialysis machines are actually doing probably have little, if any, relationship to what's causing mortality. But mortality is not the end. Well, mortality is the end, I guess. But mortality is not the final measure that matters most. If you speak to our patients, you know that often they will say that it's not the number of years or months that they live, but rather the quality of life that they experience, these quality-adjusted life years, one way of measuring that, that uh, we heard about from Dr. Sagi before. And so the challenge is that we're coming out of sort of a dark age of measuring the, the efficiency of the machine itself rather than focusing on patients and what patients choose. And so I really want to talk a little bit about the opportunities we have to look at it a different way. Several years ago, we recommended that there be several types of quality metrics for dialysis. Those in the left-hand column are the ones that we frequently currently have been using that measure the dialysis process itself. Those in the middle, process measures, but process measures that start touching on the complications and problems our patients have that are causing uh, them to be sick and causing them to die. And then those on the right, actual outcome measures, not just process measures, that give us some understanding of what their, uh, what their actual outcomes might be. And yet these, these metrics, which we proposed uh, a decade ago, still don't address patients' wishes, patients' combined plans for their life plans that they, along with their physicians, develop together. Now, we've done okay in the last few years. Dr. Friedman alluded to this before. If you look here at mortality on dialysis between 1996 and 2013, you'll see that the average mortality has fallen from 200 per thousand patient years, or about 20 percent, down to under 15 percent. That's a pretty dramatic shift that we've seen that I think we can feel pretty good about. If you look at patients' likelihood of survival with or without a cardiovascular disease or undergoing a cardiovascular procedure, in other words, defining those with cardiovascular disease, you see here that patients do far better without the sustained cardiac 
disease. Not a surprise, but this is our patients we're showing. This shows the trends in vascular access type since 2003, showing that AV fistulas has gone up to, on average, well over 60 percent. And in some of the, uh, the highest functioning dialysis facilities, over 90 percent. This is an interesting graph. This shows you the distribution of monthly hemoglobin levels in ESA-treated adults between 1995 and 2013. And you see here that there was a dramatic shift in this curve starting in approximately 2007 and 2008. Uh -huh, the years that we had published data showing that ESA-treated patients with high hemoglobins actually had higher complication rates, higher stroke rates and where the reimbursement um, uh, plan for ESAs dramatically shifted um, to uh, only pay for a narrow range of between hemoglobin 10 and hemoglobin approximately 12. And that response clearly was shown uh, that we all, we all responded as prescribing doctors to that. Just last month, Don Berwick published an article that if you haven't seen, I suggest you take a look at. He published an article that he called A New Era for Medicine. He reflected that in the first era, stretching from Hippocrates up to the 1980s or so, we had an era of medicine in which we were entrusted to judge our own quality. At that time, we were defined as a noble profession with special knowledge that was inaccessible to the laity, beneficent, and therefore we were given the right to self-regulate, unlike most other industries or most other professions. The problem is that once we started having computers that gave us the ability to actually measure how we were doing and measure outcomes, we found that with this wonderful beneficent system that there were large inconsistencies in practice and outcomes. And we found that there was a high error rate. The things that we did wrong, the way we hurt patients, surprised almost everybody. There were also injustices based on race and based on social class. And so we entered era two. Era to the era of accountability, the era of being measured in ways that we do things to try to reduce the variation in outcomes, where there was scrutiny, metrics, incentives and rewards, but not just rewards, also punishments, financial punishments for not performing well. We developed pay per performance, so we started talking about payment for achieving certain objectives or rather, the way CMS now defines it, being penalized for not obtaining adequate numbers and objectives. The problem is that the idealism of era one, as Berwick describes it, directly came into contrast with the feeling that we all have of currently being regulated to death, of having everything that we do measured, and particularly when the things that are measured perhaps not being the best measures of outcomes, feeling that we're always at odds and not being able to give our patients what they need. And so Berwick has described what he thinks we need to do, which is enter into a new era, era three, in which Berwick, of all people, this is the man who championed accountability and metrics. He's now telling us that we need to reduce mandatory measurements. He's telling us that we need to stop complex individual incentives, that that's going down the wrong track. We instead need to have us engaged in the very fabric of developing, of delivering good care, as he defines it in the points that you see in front of you. Now, we're far from Berwick's era three. But I want to show you some of the ways I think that we can start moving in that direction in an era where we're still being measured for our outcomes. 
And so I'm going to suggest that we need to look at our outcomes along sort of three different meridians. The first is the one that we've always done. That is, when populations of patients show us there's a best way of practice, that we should try to practice in that best way. When we know, for example, that the use of AV fistulas leads to fewer infections, lower mortality, and better survival, then in general, we should be encouraging and measuring the use of AV fistulas. The problem is that that's not necessarily the best thing for any given individual patient. And it probably is the time that we and our patients together need to be plotting a course that's not only best for them as part of a population, but what's really best for where they are with their lives at the time that we encounter them. And so I'm going to make an argument to having not only population-based metrics, but two other types of metrics as well. One are patient perceptions of their care, because that is their reality, and patient measured outcomes, which are now becoming far more popular, are as important, I would argue, as are the objective population-based metrics. And that secondly, individually crafted patient goals of care are critically important. When a patient is toward the end of her life and she's choosing hospice care, for example, but would like to continue dialysis treatment because the quality of her life is such that she wants to continue those treatments and um, be cared for by hospice. The set of measures that measure how well we're doing with her is very different than it is for the 23-year-old healthy dialysis patient. It's also important, I think, to look very critically at something that's been called Goodhart's Law, whenever we're talking about metrics. Goodhart uh, was an economist who made the observation that as soon as the government attempts to regulate any particular set of financial assets, these assets become unreliable as indicators of economic trends. What does that mean? That means is if you choose something to look at that measures quality or measures how something is going, because you then start paying so much attention to that one thing, it no longer remains a good measure of quality. Do you know the way teachers teach to the test? So that if you learn to answer certain kinds of questions, the students will appear that they do much better. Rather than teaching them critical thinking, rather than teaching them ways of approaching problem solving, Goodhart suggests, and I think this is critically important, that when we pick quality measures, that we be aware that as soon as we pick them and start measuring them, they may become unreliable as measures of overall quality. And so the population-based uh, based measures, those best clinical practice, let me just show you where we are. The current ones that are being measured and are being reported publicly are shown here, mortality, hospital re readmission rates, dialysis adequacy, vascular access type, a series of safety measures including the frequency of blood transfusions and hypercalcemia, and then the, um, the patient satisfaction CAPS questionnaire. We know that currently the ESRD quality incentive program, which will be paying in um, payment year 2018 is going to be based on what we're currently being measured on what we're doing right now in um, the current year 2016. And here's what they are. Clinical measures are bloodstream infections, so we finally are talking about infections. The CAPS measure, patient satisfaction. The standardized readmission ratio, KTV dialysis in all types of dialysis the standardized transfusion ratio, the kind of vascular access, and then the patient safety hypercalcemia measures. Those are the ones that we're going to be paid on, the dialysis units will be paid on in 2018, based on measures of the, what's going on today in your dialysis units. There are also a series of reporting measures, not the outcomes, but whether or not we're recording and reporting them. 
that are shown here. So those are our current population-based metrics. But we're arguing that we also need to have measures of patients' perception of care. And Woody Moss has suggested that there are several candidate measures for those kinds of patient-centered metrics, things like the global symptom assessment, or whether or not we're doing advanced care planning with our patients, or documenting preferred surrogate decision makers in the event of incapacity, and finally referring to hospice when appropriate. This isn't the only set of potential uh, experience and engagement metrics. This is one that's been recently published. I think that's a really good start in our thinking. And finally, we would argue that we have to have a set of individually crafted patient goals of care. What's important to me in my life may be very different than what's important to you in your life. We have some of our patients who tell us that what really is most important is being able to survive the next year to get to my granddaughter's wedding. We have other patients who say, you know, my sex life is really the single most important thing to me. We ought to be able to have metrics that are fashioned around what individual patients choose as what's important to them. And so in conclusion, I would say several things. Number one is we need to prepare now for the world of payment based on quality metrics. We're not in era three of Berwick's design yet. We're still in era two. And with advanced payment models such as end-stage renal disease seamless care organizations and accountable care organizations, kicking or screaming, I think most of us clinicians will be in that system in this next decade. The second is that we need to advocate for quality metrics that matter. Population-based metrics that matter, that get into the reason our patients get sick and are dying, specifically heart disease and infection. Second, patient experience and engagement metrics that give patients view measures of what's really important to them. And finally, individually crafted outcome measures, because one size does not fit all, and we need to be crafting our measures based on what individual patients choose. Thank you. That's it. I will invite uh, Dr. Daniel Sukor, Associate Professor of Psychiatry at SUNY Downstate, uh, to come, up, come to the podium. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I don't think I've ever been introduced to introduce someone before, but thank you. Um, uh, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Paul Kimmel, who is a program director uh, at the Division of Kidney Urologic and Hematological Diseases at the National Institute of Diabetes, Digestive, and Kidney Disease at the National Institute of Health. Uh, there he's responsible for the Acute Kidney Injury Program, where he oversees the management of the clinical studies as well as uh, at the HIV AIDS program. Uh, Dr. Kimmel has a, a long history of being a champion of quality of life, uh, mental health issues, depression in uh, renal disease patients. Uh, he was a mentor on my K Award. Uh, we've been working together for the past uh, 12 years or so. and. Uh, I think starting maybe in 2006, he said, Daniel, when are you going to invite me to Downstate? So I'd like to thank Dr. Sagi for finally giving me the opportunity to welcome Paul to the podium. Thank you very much. It, it really is a pleasure to be here. Um, I was a student at Winthrop Junior High School, and I remember going at lunch and saying, one day I'm going to be a doctor at Kings County, and it never happened, but uh, maybe, maybe in my future it will. Um, I really am honored to be at uh, this um, meeting because I think it's extraordinarily important um, as Dr. Sucre said, I have been very, very interested in quality of life since the first day I set foot in a dialysis unit, um, which was not coeval with Dr. Friedman's work, but a little bit behind that. Um, and when I thought about this meeting, um, 
rather than give you a huge overview about quality of life, I wanted to focus on something that was new and particular and that came out of the research that I did with Dr. Sukor because it's something that I didn't appreciate as an important problem in clinical medicine and specifically in dialysis for many years, but now I think it's extraordinarily important. So the focus of my talk is very different. It's very patient-centered in terms of showing you vignettes, case reports, um, but I hope you'll find it instructive and you'll think about your patients. How many people work in dialysis units in this audience right now? Terrific, so I think this talk is for you. Um, and I have no conflicts of interest because I work for the dear federal government. After the movie you showed me, which I think I saw in Turner Classic Movies, um, I'm so glad I don't work for CMS. I work for NIH. And yesterday they said I could come to the meeting, so I was grateful to them. Um, and my view of the end stage renal disease program is that since it started, we've been focusing on extending life, reducing mortality, morbidity, and improving quality of life. And several speakers have shown you a tremendous increase in the growth of the program. There has been improvement in survival. The costs, I would argue, and maybe in the panel discussion, we can do that, that as a percent of the total Medicare dollar, the costs of dialysis are actually plunging, considering we have a much larger population and the federal government has kept us at 1973 levels of monies. But I'm not sure that we've improved the quality of life of patients because I think it's hard to improve quality of life. And we have to deal with the fact that in trying to improve quality of life, improving outcomes, there's some risk factors that are not going to be modifiable, and I have mod modality here because in many cases it's not modifiable. But we do have some modifiable uh, factors that we can change. We can change the timing and the scheduling of our treatments. We can change the modality in many cases. We've seen that there's anemia treatment, vitamin D treatment in my medical lifetime has made a huge difference. But I think we really haven't focused on changing the psychosocial factors, the psychological determinants of health, the social determinants of health, and I'm very bluntly talking about some of the societal issues that Dr. Sagi raised, racism and poverty. And I think we can also focus on trying to change the quality of life, which is much harder to do than changing the hematocrit. So I've given many talks over the years, and I've said this probably 100 times. Depression is the most common psychiatric disorder in end-stage renal disease patients, and I see this in every psychosocial paper that I review and that I read. I think it's wrong. I think that in 2016, anxiety is probably the most common psychiatric disorder in end-stage renal disease patients. We need a little more data about this. Um, I'm working with Dr. Sucre on a paper that hopefully will be published in Jason shortly, highlighting this point. I think in many ways the psychological factors that affect patients are intertwined, and I think about depression, anxiety, and pain as being really intercorrelated, the kinds of things that affect patients, the way patients feel, the way patients talk about their life, and I think these uh, three horse people of the apocalypse represent the most common threats to patient perception of quality of life, and I think they're intrinsically modifiable. And I put this schema on the uh, screen for you very briefly. I think they are all intertwined, double arrows. I think we have to think about the way that our patients live. Dr. Friedman alluded to that in terms of the uh, money that people have, uh, the income in the United States. And I think all of these are interdigitated and affect the perception of quality of life in our patients, which is actually, I think, very difficult to measure um, using our current um, metrics. So I want to show you some patients. You see if you recognize anybody like this. First patient is a 72-year-old lady with diabetes. She's been on end-stage renal disease therapy for hemodialysis for about three years. She has cardiovascular disease. She has some peripheral neuropathy. Uh, and she has a fistula, so I hope 
Dr. Kleigner is happy with that. Um, but she's had some trouble making her appointments. Um, she's been a model patient, uh, and she's married. Um, she interacted with the staff. She interacted with the patients. She's been very cooperative. She's been the kind of patient that dialysis staff really like. And um, she was basically happy in her unit. And Dr. Friedman talked about happiness, and I think that's actually an important metric for patients. However, there's recently been a change in behavior. Um, over the last six months, she's less interested in socializing with other patients. She doesn't participate in dialysis unit activities. She's begun sleeping during her treatment. She's had some weight loss. And from a dialysis metric standpoint, she started to miss her treatments. That's bad treatment, and you lose money. You can't lose money in dialysis. So she missed some treatments over the past couple of weeks, and when the charge nurse called her husband to find out what's going on, she found some startling answers. She's refusing to be taken to the hospital or to the dialysis unit. She says, I'm scared of all the medications I'm taking. My friends in the unit are dying. I hate the staff, and I'm just tired of doing this. You've probably never heard that from a patient. She's on the standard multi-pharmacy that any dialysis patient is on. Um, and I think it's important to note that she's lost weight. The staff has been decreasing her dry weight. And her labs are those of a typical dialysis patient. So I put this together by saying there's been a change in behavior, there's been a change in adherence, and I would say this is a 72-year-old woman with anxiety overlying depression. And there's been a remarkable change in her behavior and her medical care because of that. So I told you that depression is common in end-stage renal disease patients. I'd like to remind you that there's not much administrative data about depression in dialysis patients. We did a study early on, about 15 years ago, that showed that depression is actually much commoner in later years in dialysis, in year three or four, perhaps because the patient has gotten over the initial period and realizes that that patient is going to have to wait nine years for a transplant. Coexisting anxiety, we know that anxiety coexists in general populations with depression. There's very, very little data in dialysis populations. That's going to be one of my themes. But I want to talk to you about the notion of a dual disorder. This is psychiatrically a very old concept, and it suggests if you have two psychiatric illnesses, or if you have a psychiatric illness uh, associated with a medical illness, it's very difficult to diagnose, and it's very difficult to treat, usually resistant to treatment. So how can we see if patients in our dialysis units are anxious? It, it's actually difficult, and you have to talk to the patients. First of all, you'd like to rule out medical illness or an effect of a drug, like with the sleep disorders. But the presentations can be very varied or can be occult. And sometimes they might present with behaviors that don't acknowledge anxiety but cause conflict between the staff and the patients. So when we think of anxiety, there's a complicated DSM set of diagnoses. They've just recently changed. It's a bit of a confusing landscape. But you can think of anxiety as you would typify it in a patient in a general medical practice. You can think of panic attacks, which I was much less familiar with, or phobias. I think about these globally as including obsessive disorders, which are really not part of anxiety anymore, uh, somatization, the feeling of breathlessness, the feeling of chest pain, dizziness, all kinds of symptoms that may not be related to a medical situation at all. Think of a young man who gets anxious and has to treat, uh, has to treat himself by breathing into a, a paper bag. So anxiety is characterized by worry and obsessive thoughts. There's some overlap with depression there. Uh, and it is commonly related to substance use disorders, which we know are prevalent in our patients on dialysis. So it's a challenge to medical diagnosis because of the overlap with somatic symptoms, similarly to depression. It needs a high level of clinical surveillance to really figure out if the patient is anxious. And these are behaviors that can interfere 
with functioning of your dialysis unit, relationships with the staff and the physicians. So the differential diagnosis, I just put this up because I went through the DSM-5. Um, it's a rarefied set of specific diagnoses, but I think when I told you to think of panic disorder and panic attack and generalized anxiety, that is basically the take home message of this DSM-5 set of diagnoses. And again, think about the cognitive symptoms, worry, and obsessive thought. These are not included in current DSM-5 diagnoses, but I think it's useful to think of them in the same context because our patients don't really present having read the DSM-5. They present with symptoms. So how would I think about this various set of diagnoses in the context of a dialysis unit? Panic attack. What's a panic attack? Suddenly the patient is breathless, has palpitations, feels terrible. And two hours in dialysis, the patient says, I want to sign off now. That's a panic attack. We think the patient's just crazy or obstreperous. Well, the patient may be crazy. The patient has anxiety. Phobias, right? Patients who are afraid of blood. Patients who are afraid of noises in the dialysis unit. Obsessive compulsive disorders, again, not part of anxiety, but think of these behaviors. I always like to sit in that chair. If I can't be dialyzed at unit number one, I'm going home right now. You never had a patient like that. John is always my tech. He's the only one who understands my access. If he can't take care of me now, I'm going home. That's anxiety. So this few data, uh, if you go back in the literature, much of the data has been collected by Dr. Sucker. There's almost no data about the epidemiology of anxiety. We have almost no data about treatment of anxiety in dialysis patients. Um, although several studies do suggest that it's closely intertwined with um, depression, which we've become aware of over the last 20 years is an important problem for dialysis patients. There are no randomized controlled trials. So as somebody who sits at NIH, I think this is a fertile area for research. How to treat this condition? Well, after you diagnose it, uh, the general treatment is using SSRIs. Uh, there's almost no data in dialysis patients. Um, and there's an important caveat that anxiolytics, benzodiazepines, are not currently first-line therapy for patients with anxiety, but they may be useful for an acute episode, but you have to be very cautious because these are drugs that are contraindicated in patients with substance abuse disorders. So you really have to take a very careful history in understanding how to treat the patient. You're probably better off with going with an antidepressant SSRIs. I think they're very promising avenues of therapy using talk therapy. Downstate is now one of the homes of cognitive behavioral therapy. Dr. Sucre spearheaded a very influential article on the treatment of depression with CBT. I think there are opportunities to consider this for the treatment of anxiety. And again, I want to emphasize that this is a clinical responsibility of physicians, of nurses, of technologists to understand whether the patients are anxious. I'm going to, in the interest of time, skip this. Uh, I'll say that the clinical interaction between the patient and the nephrologist is very important. And from my standpoint as a nephrologist who's been interested in psychosocial issues, for more than 25 years, I always include mental health personnel. I don't feel that this is my area of expertise. And there are challenges with that according to Medicare reimbursement as well. Uh, but our first line of defense is the dialysis social worker who is trained to diagnose and is trained to treat and is trained to interact with medical personnel. And we have to use dialysis social workers to be involved in the psychosocial care of our patients rather than the way that they're actually treated now. I use psychologists and psychiatrists as partners in the team, and I do try to engage them in the treatment of patients, but the patient has to feel comfortable with the nephrologist and feel comfortable with a referral to a psychiatrist because sometimes this can be stigmatizing and there is 
perhaps resistance and another medical interlude, another appointment, it can be very difficult. Here's my second patient. This is a 28-year-old man who's been on dialysis for about two years. He's had hypertensive nephrosclerosis. He has hyperparathyroidism, which we're not going to deal with, and he has anemia, very common medical problems. He's been discharged from the Army three years ago after service in Afghanistan. He's been a long-standing member of a gang in Brooklyn since his teens, and now he's a senior counselor. He has the same kind of job that I have. I'm a senior advisor. <coughs> uh, he has a family history of end-stage renal disease, uh, and he has a history of sporadic drug use for many years, including heroin and cocaine. He has the best shift, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 6 a.m. He's had a lot of problems with his access. He's been scheduled for vein mapping, and he is a continual no-show, no-call. What's he like? He appears very cool, calm, and collected, say the dialysis unit staff. And if you ask him, he says, I'm a tough guy. He does what he wants, when and how he wants to do it. He does not like schedules or being told what to do. He states that he knows what he's doing, and nobody can tell him different. He appears angry and agitated if he has to wait for his treatment and often becomes verbally outspoken towards staff. I'm sure you've never seen a patient like that. He often shortens his treatment, and when you look at his percent adherence, it's poor, and he'll tell you that this place is like Helmen Province. So he's difficult to take care of, and you might guess he has high interdialytic weight gains, he has hyperkalemia and hyperphosphatemia. His medications show resistance to medication or resistance to good dialysis practice. He doesn't like to take iron pills. He's got to be on a lot of drugs, which he probably doesn't take. <clears throat> and his blood pressures reflect this. His interdialytic weight gains reflect this. His labs and his resistance to therapy reflect this. Mr. C has poor adherence. He has potentially disruptive behavior in the unit. He's a 28-year-old man with anxiety. And what you've seen me present is consistent with post-traumatic stress disorder. Events in the dialysis unit evoke events during his wartime service. And that is a different topic now, according to the DSM, but it requires evaluation. He has panic attacks. He says, get me off this machine now. And he may be unwilling to discuss this with dialysis staff. He doesn't want to go into the fact that he has problems because of his wartime service. So his treatment is going to be difficult because there's a clear psychosocial uh, aspect to it which is complicated and definitely needs a therapist, a talk therapist. He's going to need extensive evaluation and the treatment is going to be intensive. So probably beyond the SSRIs, he would be a good candidate for CBT or talk therapy, but the patient has to understand and want that treatment. So the clinician and the dialysis unit staff have to gain and maintain trust. This patient is not going to trust you at this point. So the major challenges to this person's treatment are self-awareness, a willingness to accept therapy, and a therapeutic relationship, and it's incumbent upon all the dialysis unit health personnel to gain this patient's trust. All right, I'd like to tell you about a last patient. She's a 67-year-old white woman. She's been on dialysis for about a year. Um, she has analgesic nephropathy, which is a diagnosis that we see a lot in Philadelphia and Washington, D.C. I don't know about Brooklyn, New York. Uh, she's been on NSAIDs for 10 years due to arthritis. She complains of chronic pain in her lower back and knees for years. She has migraine headaches and she has some of the other diseases that are associated with end-stage renal disease. She became a widow about two years ago. She lives alone. She may be a little isolated. She has a daughter. It's not clear what the relationship with the daughter is. She will tell you readily that she's depressed, and she feels it's in part due to her despondency about becoming a dialysis patient. So she didn't look at dialysis as life-extending. Perhaps she looked at it as life-enduring. She also is depressed because she has a bad relationship with her daughter and her grandchildren. And she may be a little hopeless. She doesn't see the use of getting up in the morning. She can't sleep at night. She has a life that's devoted to pain. She can't sleep. 
And she has discussed her feelings with the dialysis social worker extensively every day that she's on dialysis. She was provided with a referral to the psychiatry clinic. She couldn't make those appointments <clears throat> for some reason. She complains of pain during dialysis treatments. She can't get comfortable in any one of the chairs. Um, she's very scared of the machines and the alarms. It's a chaotic environment. But she's very happy that she has one dialysis technologist who can take care of her. But if that person is not in the dialysis unit, she won't be able to get good dialysis and she won't be comfortable because that one person is the only person who knows how to make her feel good. So since starting dialysis, she's missed treatments, she comes in late, and she causes a ruckus in the dialysis unit. She's been hospitalized several months, she's missed treatments, and uh, she's been informed at monthly meetings, six monthly meetings about adherence and its importance and survival, but her behavior hasn't changed. So you can see that she's on sleep medicine, she's on pain medicines, and um, she gains a lot of weight between treatments. Um, her ferritin uh, is high, her PTH is high. So she represents a complex situation. And I would say that analgesic nef uh, nephropathy even before getting to end-stage renal disease, is complex psychiatrically. This patient needs an extensive evaluation, perhaps has a dual disorder. We have to be concerned about substance abuse, anxiety, and depression in this woman who also has cardiovascular disease and renal disease. Like the patient I just told you about, the treatment is going to depend on the evaluation and is going to depend in many ways on trust in the dialysis unit, the patient understanding that she has a psychiatric problem that needs to be treated intensively, probably with talk therapy. So this patient I would also like to see in CBT or talk therapy besides SSRIs. So she's complex, and like the other patient, the issue of gaining trust is key. And again, you have to think about anxiolytics would not be advised in this patient who probably has substance dis abuse disorders. So I'd like to conclude by saying anxiety in end-stage renal disease is probably extremely common. Ascertaining the diagnosis requires a great clinician. It requires acumen and it requires you searching for the diagnosis. And simply asking the patient, are you anxious, is not going to be enough because sometimes the patient is not even aware of anxiety. And it's not really the symptom that you're talking about, it's the disorder that you'd like to know. The presentations can be very variable and often occult, but I'd like you to think about it as behavior that's disruptive to medical care and unit function. I'd like you to consider dual diagnoses, substance abuse and depression. Um, I'd like you to consider the disruptive behavior and non-compliance or red flags about anxiety, a disorder that we don't think about much in dialysis units. I want to emphasize that there are very few data in ESRD or earlier stages of CKD on anxiety, and I think this is an important research effort. I think mental health personnel have to be recruited in the care of such patients. It's not easy given the dissentives of Medicare. And I think we have to think about multiple therapeutic approaches. I'd be very disappointed if we just used SSRIs in these patients and didn't use other forms of talk therapy. So um, I think that, as I showed you in an earlier slide, anxiety represents a very important, under-evaluated, and uh, probably quite prevalent threat to our patients' quality of life. I feel like when I first understood that sleep disorders were so common and such a threat to patients' quality of life that we were sort of in the beginning of a new therapeutic era, I'd like to enlist you as partners in that. I'd like you to think about as dialysis unit personnel enlisting the assistance of mental health personnel, and that's why my relationship with Dr. Sucre has been so important. So like voting in Chicago, enlist those mental health personnel early and often. Uh, Here's a set of references. Uh, I think uh, probably uh, the best reference on this is uh, Daniel's paper in Jason in 2014, and there's also a nice review in seminars 
in dialysis. And I would like to thank my mentors and colleagues, uh, David Reese at George Washington, Rolf Peterson. Uh, Daniel Sucker has been uh, first a mentor, but now he's a colleague and he's leading me to understand um, these issues in end-stage renal disease and Dr. Levy. And I want to thank you all for your time and attention. I've tried to be fast because of the time that all the previous speakers took. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kimmel. That was superb. I'd like to invite the uh, presenters to the podium, Dr. Friedman, Dr. Kliger, and uh, Suk Daniel. Uh, we, we give about 10 to 15, 10 minutes for questioning. Uh, and I would like to first ask uh, maybe from the audience, or so come, come here. So before I present the question answer session, uh, the audience are more than welcome to ask questions, but I would like to limit it to at least just three questions from the audience if possible. And uh, first, Daniel has a question, Daniel. Thank you all for your talks. I'm going to ask you a question which uh, is unrelated to all the things that you spoke about. Uh, it was alluded to that there is a new CMS mandate that depression now needs to be screened for at the dialysis center. I'm curious as to what the three of you think that how this will impact the future of uh, dialysis care and the relationship with, uh, I guess, mental health treatment. Uh, thank you, Daniel. I think this is a great thing because it's really a mandate from the government that we have to think about the mental health and the quality of life of our patients. I've had many discussions with Dr. Nissenson over the years who's been worried about this for about 15 years. But I think just like looking at quality of life metrics in the dialysis unit, this will focus on a problem. It'll make it part of dialysis care, just like we look at anemia. And I think it'll be an opportunity to start conversations with patients. So I, it's another administrative burden, but I think it's a great opportunity. So go, go ahead. Just quickly, I mean, I agree with that. I think, though, we have to be careful um, it's easy to identify depression. It's a whole other issue to come up with a game plan to deal with the large numbers of our patients once they're identified. I have a question for the uh, members. Uh, where do you think psychosocial evaluation should occur? Before the patient is discharged from the hospital? Because the burden has been placed tremendously onto the dialysis units. Hospitals are incentivized to get the patient out. They don't have time to evaluate the intensity of anxiety and depression and the comorbidities. And the dialysis units are burdened with not having the ability to provide that support even though we would like to. So it's a question for the team members. Where should this begin? Well, I'll start first because I don't think it should begin in any of the places you just said. Mm -hmm. I think that we're clearly moving towards what some people have called population health or integrated care. If we really put the patient at the center rather than a dialysis unit or a hospital at the center, and if we're all incentivized to give the best care to keep people out of hospitals and to give them the best care that we can, then that whole, equ that whole equation changes. So I think it needs to begin with changing our, our uh, frame of reference and being able to deliver care in an integrated fashion. Uh, thank you. So, uh, I, Freeman, do you want to comment on that? No, no, no. no. All right. Um, so I'll take a crack at that. I, I think I, I, I've never disagreed with Dr. Kleiger before. It's really shocking. Um, I think the dialysis unit is the place to do that. I don't think it can be done in the hospital, especially when the mandate in the hospital is to get the patient out in 30 minutes, you know, from the time that they're uh, admitted. So it's very chaotic. You get these lists of what the medications are. The old medications make a lot of mistakes. It's not the place for a psychosocial engagement. The dialysis unit is a place where patients are going to be treated for one, three, five years, hopefully. And I think in many ways, it is a, an emblem of ongoing chronic care. And my mantra has been for 25 years that dialysis unit social workers should not be employed in transportation, in filling out forms for insurance, but they should be employed the way they're treated. Let's, 
These guys have to hear them. And they are equipped to do psychosocial assessment. Dial uh, di depression and dialysis is very hard to assess, probably hard to treat. It may be intrinsically related to a chronic disease, but it's an opportunity for ongoing care and dialogue between the social work staff, and I think that's exactly the way we do things. And if we could deploy the personnel that are federally mandated to be there to do the right kind of work, I think we could be successful. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so you hear agreement. So I don't disagree with you either. Uh, so let me just ask um, the yes out there. How many patients do you have that you take care of? Okay, 196. Two units, 196 patients. Can you imagine doing what we just heard Dr. Kimmel suggested you do for every one of your patients? Stand up, please. Right. So I agree because I showed you where the cuts came. The most people that were affected were the labor uh, that was providing services. So it's going to be more, a bigger challenge. Uh, I would like to invite the audience for questions. So, uh, Dr. Undra. Well, I want to tell you that's a beautiful tie you have, Dr. Anwar. <laughs> and, um, well, I think screening is, is difficult. You know, um, we were asked to write an article about screening in, uh, for depression, and I think that's a good thing to do. I actually think that we do screen people. We have a psychosocial assessment at the beginning of dialysis, and I think what I found out is it's hard to assess for anxiety, so I don't have a problem with using a HADS or a GAD, you know, to evaluate uh, this kind of thing. And I agree with Dr. Kleiger that trying to do that and trying to treat people is difficult, but that's what we're supposed to do as physicians and healthcare personnel, because these are debilitating symptoms for patients. So I, I think, what are you supposed to do when you have a patient in the dialysis unit for the first 30 days? Of course you're supposed to evaluate them, just like you go after the phosphate and you go after the KT over V and you make sure the access is. This is a complex patient and we become the primary care physicians for those dialysis patients. And if we're ignoring this, it's not a good thing. My wife in private practice takes care of general patients and half of her practice is depression and anxiety. That's, that's just her alone. You know, the patients have about 50% <laughs> depression and anxiety as well. Thank oh. you. I think it's a great question. Yeah, yeah. I would just like to say, uh, to, to comment on that, I mean, so why is depression all of a sudden being asked uh, by CMS uh, to, for us to screen? And I think the reason is, is because there is finally data that has compelled them to do so due to the work that Dr. Kimmel has done and others. But Dr. Kimmel largely has been championing this for years. And I think... Do we now have enough data to say that anxiety needs to be screened for? D definitely not. Uh, but how does that, we're never gonna get a mandate that comes down that says screen for anxiety unless there's people who are motivated to take a look and say, do we really need to do that or not? 
So that, that burden, I think, is on us to decide whether we should screen for anxiety, and then we can compel the system to adapt to it as it grows and kind of you know, reaches out to all the other uh, kind of broad network. Um, I have one more question for the uh, panel, and that's for Dr. Friedman. Uh, you showed us that, you know, there's, I think the element that's missing in patients is to realize a sense of gra gratitude that we, are, that we have the technology and today you can survive. I mean, if you look back in the days when you're struggling with resource limited conditions, when you did not have the technology, I felt that most of the psychosocial issues that might have existed sort of evaporated. They just wanted to live, get me on the machine and, you know, so the whole trend has changed. Dr. Friedman, could you comment in the current era where now rich countries have such tremendous amount of resources? So how do The entire discussion now faces the problem that we don't all use the same definition of the terms that have been given to us and comparing unit A with outcome and survival with unit B as yet is very difficult because we are talking different languages. If I were to go into the unit in Chicago, the unit in Denver, the unit in Brooklyn, and try and measure anxiety, there would be different standards, different rates, different survivals. And I think we're still early in the course of knowing what we're looking for, and that independent investigation is a good thing to have, and I'm not ready to subscribe to a uniform definition of what must be done because the way we do it is so different and what we collect in our patients is not uniform enough to feel that we can say do this if you find that and do that if you find this. Thank you. You make me very anxious, Dr. Friedman. Sorry? <laughs> you make me very anxious. I'm not uh, but, taking a level of anxiety on the panel. But, but, but that's the precise question that we were coming to. Daniel and I have discussed this before. What about addressing the anxiety and the stress of providers that provide the care to this dialysis? I mean, I can see my social workers going crazy, so. Yeah, well, if, you're, if you're taking care of 194 patients and trying to see to it that their depression is not only measured but attended to, and on top of that, their anxiety is uh, recognized and approached, uh, this is a monumental anxiety-provoking task. But I, I just want to come back to the point. It's, 200 patients over a year. So when we think about the patient as an ongoing thing, it's not something that has to be completed in a month. It's a relationship that you have. I'd argue that your dialysis unit should have 100 patients per social workers. I think it has to be reorganized. But the point that you make is a general point about medical practice, which we know that there is a high level of stress. We know that there's a high level of physician impairment in involving many behaviors, including drug use behaviors. So it's part of that physician police thyself uh, culture that you pointed out, Dr. Kleiger. And I think we also have to be cognizant of the fact that doing good work for patients, whether you're a social worker, whether you're a technologist, whether you're a nurse, whether you're a physician, is not easy and it can take a toll on people and families, as my wife told me. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, Joe. Thank you, Bill, for a very interesting discussion. Um, we've talked about psychological issues in dialysis patients for many, many years. Paul mentioned some of the work that we've done in our particular discussion. Have we moved the needle? I mean, now we're looking at depression screening. We're going to find it. We know it's in there. So let me, let me just start quickly. You know, it's interesting. We, we did a small study years ago in which we were screening for depression, identified a group of patients who uh, indeed were depressed, uh, went on then to have them formally assessed by a psychiatrist and, and identified a subset of previously unidentified, clearly depressed patients. And the majority of them absolutely would not go into therapy. So it, it is a very substantial challenge, I think. 
I would want to add one thing. Uh, having been at the birthplace of the American Association of Kidney Patients, which was at our Kings County program unit, that it's very hard to generalize and then be specific about what you should do about patient A, B, or C, lacking the data on patients A, B, or C, and the capacity, the number of social workers, the number of psychiatrists that are needed to get that data reliably. So, so far, it's hit and miss and guesswork in much of what we do and report. I'd love to see it better, but I don't know how, and I think that the patient leadership is getting stronger, and I would like to see their reports as what they'd like to have done. So I, I agree with Dr. Friedman. John, it's a pleasure to see you. You know, when we were in NYU Bellevue, I was the senior resident and John was the intern, and now it's amazing to me that he's so much older than I am. It's, it's amazing how time flies. Um, but I think... <laughs> no, you have a nice tie, it's nice. Uh, one of the uh, things that has happened over the past 30 years is depression and other psychological issues have become changed from being a non-entity or people saying, of course, they're depressed, they're on dialysis, to being recognized as a separate kind of comorbidity. And I'm looking forward to better research to see if actually treatment makes a difference. And I'm interested in mortality studies. That may be another 10 or 15 years in coming. And Dr. Sucker is involved in a nationwide study where we're having problems recruiting patients into treatment because the resistance that I talked about in the anxiety talk of not recognizing it's a problem, not wanting to go into therapy, not wanting to take medicines is so big. But I think we've made a lot of progress and I think you're right, there's a regulatory overlay where the progress we would like to see is mostly scientific, but I think we'll muddle through in the next 10 or 15 years. I think there's been an enormous advance, which now every nephrologist recognizes that that's a huge problem that has to be at least considered. Uh, thank you all for your talk. I know that there might be some more questions, but we do want to remain on schedule, so we're going to take a short break now.